This is the VIP Podcast, Virginia in Politics. Let's listen to host Chris Saxman explore the personalities and policies that connect the Commonwealth. The VIP Podcast is brought to you by the VCTA, Broadband Association of Virginia and Virginia Free. The views and opinions expressed here do not necessarily reflect the views and opinions of the VCTA and Virginia Free or our sponsors. We're just having a great talk here with uh, Delegate Cliff Hayes. I'm Chris Saxman, former member of the House of Delegates, served for eight years, four terms, undefeated, unindicted. <laughs> That's the way you got to play this game. Yes, sir. This is the VIP podcast brought to you by VCTA, the Broadband Association of Virginia and Virginia Free, of which I am the executive director. Delegate Hayes, great to have you on the VIP podcast. Congratulations, you're a new VIP. Well, thank you. It's so got to feel pretty good. Yeah, yeah. It's good to be here and to follow in the footsteps of many like yourself who have paved the way here in the House of Delegates. Well, and uh, we're just honored to be here with a sense of reverence and respect and just um, happy to be here and here to serve. Well, that's a, that's a great way to start a conversation that uh, Virginia Free likes to hear as a nonprofit, nonpartisan pro business organization. We like to have everyone get along and make good decisions. Uh, I was talking with. Um, former colleague of yours, I think he's, did you serve with Chris Jones? I did. Okay. He was chairman of appropriations. Absolutely. Were you on the appropriations with him? I was. So you know how he operates. Oh, absolutely. So we were talking about that and I said, do you miss the place? Um, you know, was there anything, you, would you come back? You know, have you thought about the administration? You know, all that kind of stuff. He's like, no. At the end of the day, you just pass the baton. You just mm -hmm. take it from one person to the next and hopefully you don't drop it and leave it better than you found it. Well, you know, that's an important uh, component that we all need to have in serving here, and that's humility, and understand that many people have come before us, and this institution is a very, very important part of our fabric of not only the Commonwealth, but this nation and this country, and to make sure that we understand that uh, whether we're here or not, this place will go on. And the question is, what will we do when we are here to help improve the lives, the um, economy, uh, et cetera, for the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so I think that's a very um, humble uh, statement and acknowledgement, I think, uh, for not only um, how this place continues to roll on, but also an acknowledgement that it went through some very, very, very interesting times in order to help us land where we are today. Well spoken, and that's fantastic. And I, I can't agree with you more that because people say, what's it like to work there? And I would say, I work in a museum. Hmm. It's a living museum. Um, and you've, I think you captured it beautifully. And you've met, you mentioned humility twice, or humble and humility. And hum, humble comes from the word of earth, ground, hmm. um, the root word. And that always strikes me when someone can recognize in themselves the need for humility in the moment. Hmm. We get caught up in the great passions of politics, the great debates. Well, that, um, to me, great debates these days. <laughs> <laughs> but, and especially you see it on the, on the, in the Appropriations Committee. You see, this is where the rubber hits the road. Nothing really happens in the Virginia legislature until it hits the budget, right? You can pass a bill, but if it doesn't move money, it's not doing too much. <laughs> amen. Fair? amen. Fair? Amen. You get an amen on that one. That's even stronger. <laughs> but tell us where we are now with the budget negotiations. You passed the budget out of the House, it went to the Senate, they of course rejected it, you did likewise to theirs, it's now in a conference committee. We're hoping to get out by Saturday. You didn't seem to have good news on that this morning here at eight o'clock on Thursday morning before SINADA, SINADA, which however you want to pronounce it. Uh, where are we? Well, we like to always remain uh, in a posture of being a prisoner of hope. So <laughs> it might happen, You're crushing me with it this. might happen. <laughs> Prisoner uh, of hope. Yeah, we'll keep working towards. Uh, is that your is that your bumper sticker for your, your real life? <laughs> Absolutely, Prisoner for my of life. Hope. For your yeah. life. Uh, yeah, that we, we we never give up. Okay. Um, as uh, I I think of Samuel. Is that is that? Did you just come off the top of the head with that one? Prisoner no, of hope? just um, I guess just in, in terms of my faith. Okay. Uh, it's conversation. Okay. In the household, in which I was brought up in. Strong faith uh, household. Oh yeah, absolutely. I am who I am because somebody loved me. Uh, my father, Clifton Hayes Sr., uh, if I could just be, you know, a tenth of that man. Um, Is he still with us? He's still with us. Okay. My mother. Okay. Um, if I could be, you know, a fifth of who she was, or oh, is. Okay. Uh, Carolyn Hayes. Um, we just work uh, to understand uh, that we are working on 
the shoulders of them okay and the uh, nourishment and you know bringing our family together is what we build on and so that's where that comes from okay it's, it's a strong foundation you yeah. went to you went to Norfolk State on a baseball scholarship to play ball there uh, infielder um, I often find that politics and baseball are very similar with respect to a lot of roles uh, it's a grind it's every day and you got to be at the grind every day to be a part of it yeah you just can't come back no. uh, you, I mean when you're there you're there and there's sometimes. so many similarities to it do you find that as a former ball player I do and I uh, not only overlay that to politics but to life um, in terms of politics and serving as a legislator, right. um, it's a lot to be learned from that as well. That um, there are going to be some times when <laughs> you're going to have to step up to the plate. Um, nobody else can help you. Right. Um, it's going to be a lot dependent upon how prepared you are. And you have to step in the box. It's the individual in a team game. Yeah. It's so strong in baseball. Yeah. Because it's, it's, you know, it's pitcher, batter, catcher. But then everyone else comes to play when the ball is presented. Absolutely, to them. and you can't take any of it personal, personally. That's um, the hard part, isn't it, in politics? It's not hard for me because again, I overlay okay. the love of this game that I learned at a very early age. My father always taught me to uh, pursue life with the understanding and the fundamentals of this game. We right. taught you how to play that. It wasn't just to learn this game, but it was to teach you also how to traverse and to uh, be great in life, not just successful, uh, because you'll attain success, but the question is what you will do right. with your success. Right. And so in this space where we have legislation, sometimes it's not always easy legislation, but if you have a fun a fundamental foundation and an understanding for the uh, policies that you're trying to support or the legislation that you're carrying. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes <laughs> because you are successful at getting things, difficult things passed, um, that comes with some chin music, <laughs> some high and tight inside. Okay. Sometimes people throw at your head. Right, right, right. Uh, but you don't shy away from it. You step right back up into the box, and you're ready for the next pitch. Dig in. Sometimes you, you strike out. You can't fall out. in love with the last pitch. You can't. You can't hate the last pitch either. You just no. Get, it's the next pitch. You might just, strike it's out. It's the next bill, right? You just boom. Then, then here comes the next. One. Just another one. Yeah, and if you concentrate too much on what happened right, before, right. it could lead to your detriment. Whether it was a successful passage of a bill, and you're glorifying and too proud of what just happened. Mm -hmm. Now the next one comes and the question is how prepared for you are you for the next for the next pitch and so uh, that's the approach that I take to life. I don't take any of it personally. Um, when we're trying to turn a double play people are going to slide at your feet and back in the day when I played um, there were no rubber cleats right? Right. So you'll get taken out oh, yeah. with steel cleats. And so you have scratches and scars and cuts and bruises and all of that stuff. Um, but it's a part of the game. Well, that's a, I can go in a lot of different directions because I love baseball so much. Um, in today's session, though, let's try to get back to the topic at hand. With the, How would you describe, in baseball terms, uh, this session and then the budget negotiations? Uh, this session um, has been, again, um, you can't take any one session, any one day for that matter, any one hour <laughs> here in this place um, too seriously. Um, and you cannot take the former moment right. and think that everything I think, I going think, forward is going to be the same. I think this session is a low scoring game ah. in about the eighth inning. Mm where it, but I just don't see a lot of big points, uh, big debates being won. I don't see a lot of, you know, I think the governor had a victory on the mask mandate, but I don't think, so it might be one nothing. I mean, I just don't see a lot of scoring uh, on either side. Well, a defensive battle. It's like, it's like Floyd Mayweather just doing the, the, the jab on the way out, you know? 
But sometimes that those are the best I'm games. Sorry to mix metaphors in baseball and boxing. Yeah, but those <laughs> those are some of the best games. As a right? catcher, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, they're exhausting in that regard. And so the question is, are we here for entertainment, right? Mm -hmm. And just watch a bunch of home runs and the score is twenty one to twenty five. Is is that what we're here for, or the substance, right? Well, see, I love the beauty of the game. Yeah, I mean, a two to one the game. The hitting and running. Oh, then calling the next pitch. Yeah, and getting the guy to lean in. Yeah, the curve on the outside part of the plate and coming back and busting. Taking it in. out the yeah, right yeah. field down oh, yeah. the line. Absolutely. That's that's and that's why I like baseball and politics. And I try to draw the meta, the, the the similarities together because once you understand baseball and its complexity and the rules and all the nuances, the unwritten rules. And you apply them to politics. And I wish people would appreciate both at those levels mm. and see them for what they are rather than get lost in the, the, the home runs. Mm. The home runs when it's a, a it's 12 wonderful game. to hit them. But. It's great to hit them. They feel sweet <laughs> off the bat. You don't even feel them, right? But we lose sight in those pyrotechnics. Mm -hmm. And I think the beauty of the game of American politics and baseball lies in its complexity and its nuances and understanding that and appreciating it, absolutely, and being hum humble in your terms, you know, your words, in those moments, I think is a deeper appreciation. I think if we all did that, we'd get along a lot better. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You can't take any of it personally. And this whole thing of, you know, <laughs> growling at each other and <laughs> barking. I mean, I read about the stories of, and formally, uh, before getting elected, and before actually I was a city councilman before coming here, but even before that, I worked for many elected officials um, in my life, okay. you know, on the local level, on the state level as well. Um, but coming here back then, uh, understanding how folks could be on the floor and on opposite sides of issues, mm -hmm. but then they'll be, you know, you'll see them walking down the street chatting or sitting in a coffee shop, mm -hmm. um, talking at you know, just chopping it up about their families. Yeah, yeah right, um, right. Is there is there, is there a, um, a politician or a political figure that you've modeled yourself after? Because you you try to emulate swings, or you know, you probably you said you followed your father's footsteps, and oh, yeah, you try to emulate absolutely. your father. Obviously, you once said you'd be one tenth the man your father was. You you'd, you'd feel good about yourself. Is there someone in politics you feel the same way? There's so I'm I'm a culmination of the people that helped me get here, helped mold and shape, you know, the viewpoint that I right. have of this place. My father's one okay. uh, at home. Uh, but then, of course, um, uh, my African-American history professor at Norfolk State University, okay. former mayor of the city of Chesapeake, the late Dr. William E. Ward, okay. um, uh, was a strong mentor to me and actually helped talk me into uh, running for local Okay. office for city council. You can blame him. As he was actually retiring, uh, he and um, some wonderful men in the city of Chesapeake and leaders in the African-American community by an organization called Chesapeake Men for Progress. Okay. And I sat at the feet of many of those leaders. Um, uh, another who helped run my campaign during that time was Dr. Hugo Owens. Okay. Um, who was a dentist and an elected official and politician who... Um, so local people. I mean, the, oh, those are the ones yeah. who made the most impact on you. You sound, you sound like, the. I mean, just, just having never met you before. This is one of the things I enjoy about not preparing. Uh, and that these are the unscripted uh, video podcasts that we're doing here. Just to getting to know you at, the, at that organic level, like who are you? I mean, I, a lot of people go, well, I'm a Reagan Republican, or I'm a New Deal Democrat, or, you know, I like Obama, or uh, Bush, or Clinton, or whomever. But what I'm struck with uh, from Delegate Cliff Hayes is this closeness to your family, your community. That's where you're grounded. You grew up in the district in which you, which you represent. Absolutely. You went to a local school, you stayed local, you went to graduate school in Boston. But that's what really is, 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 is centered in you. Mm -hmm. That's your plumb line, it feels like. And as I pursued that furthering of my education, these same folks, like, I mean, they dug into their shoeboxes almost and helped me get there and continue on. 
Okay. So I also came under the umbrella of a former boss of mine who actually had served as the longest serving it's a big sheriff. Championship bring it back there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> a lot of hard work. <laughs> hard work. So I wear it proudly. And what's that? What's that ring? It's a, a championship ring uh, for college baseball with Norfolk State when I played there. Okay. Uh, we had three successful championships. Uh, in BIAC. Well, at that time we were in the CIAA. Okay. Okay. And uh, three wonderful championships there. But after um, I finished at Norfolk State and playing baseball and was a little hard-headed and ruined my baseball aspirations. Why were um, you hard-headed? What was hard? What was, you don't uh, seem like a hard-headed guy, Cliff. You seem like a nice, soft-spoken, wonderful gentleman. Yeah, but, you know, we all... We're young. We're, we're young. young and when we're young and few... What did Bush, George Bush say? When I was young and foolish, I was young and few, foolish. Yeah. Something like that. So our baseball coach, Marty Miller, told us day one, coming there on a scholarship. I know you all are ambitious, you love the sports and so forth, but don't let me catch you playing sandlot football, pick up basketball games, anything, really? because you're here to play baseball. And one day uh, it snowed and classes were canceled mm -hmm. and so forth, and my roommates, two of them, we, we stayed in a suite. And in, what year are you in dorm. school at this point? 87. I mean, what year in college? What, what sophomore, freshman, what year? What year? Oh, my junior year. Junior. Oh, junior year. Okay. We um, decided that we were going to go out, and two of my roommates were members of the football team. One was a defensive tackle, uh, who was our first baseman. Um, That's a big first baseman. Yeah, Mel Waring. <laughs> That's a big mean, first baseman. And, and he could hit it, let me tell you. Yeah. Mel Waring. Uh, Mel uh, was talking a whole lot of trash talk about what he was going to do and all of this stuff. And we went out to play on the grounds there uh, next to Scott Dorm in the snow because classes were canceled. And, um, I, you know, as a former cornerback in high school, I yeah. wasn't going to allow him to just run by me. So I'm going to reach out to this defensive tackle, <laughs> right? And I'm going to take him down. But I held on and his momentum, and I slipped on, your throwing and arm. His, on my throwing arm, and his momentum, you imagine a defensive tackle, yeah, right? Yeah. He's motoring, and I'm grabbing on to him. Force equals mass times acceleration. Oh, my gosh. And all I remember is uh, looking up at him as he continued on, <laughs> and I was holding on, and I felt this crunch. Oh, So kids playing at home on the board version, uh, don't do that. Yeah, absolutely. Don't reach out with your throwing arm and try to arm tackle a defensive tackle. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and don't go out and sandlot football if you can help it. You just don't need to if okay. you know it's something that you not supposed to do. Not you were asked to do it. I was, scholarship yeah, was on the line. Yeah, and, but fortunately, uh, Coach Miller honored you know by okay. staying there. I switched from the other side, from third base and shortstop to second base. Okay. With the short throw Okay. at that point. Did you have surgery? I didn't. Okay. Um, it still hurt It today? was just ignorance on my part. Does it hurt today still or has it healed up? Nah. Okay. It, it was ignorance on our part, okay. you know, because all of the kids, we were going to hide it. So we didn't uh, tell the coach. Uh oh. oh and gosh. so we didn't tell the trainer. This we didn't is, tell the coach. That was spring ball then. Are you, this yeah, this is like in... Uh, January, yeah, yeah. so we were about to get started for spring practices and okay. stuff, and uh, we went to the gym, and we got on the weights, mm. and we were going to make it stronger, but oh, the weights were just, just tearing it up, and I was just tearing it up worse and so forth, so on. I couldn't re lift my arm high as this at that point, but later built up these muscles and had a little short little toss okay, <laughs> kind of thing. Okay. <laughs> and uh, when the spring came, coach was like, what in the world happened to your arm, scouts? Everybody was like, what in the world is going on with Hayes' arm, you know? Mm. And so the dreams kind of went down to twos, but. Dreams of playing pro ball? That yeah. was your trajectory, you think? Yeah, that's okay. what my trajectory, I believe, was. Sure. Um, my passion was to do that. Okay. And. Um, and that was the end of it. But I'm a blessed man because, as I mentioned earlier, the foundation of my mother and father, I wanted to be so much like my dad, so I yeah. wanted to play this game. But my mother was a quality assurance specialist for the federal government. Oh. And so at that time in her career, uh, this was around the time that PCs just kind of came. Sure, sure, sure. 
and were introduced. Mm -hmm. And so um, we're about the same age. She started bringing these PCs home, you know, and taking me to Radio Shack and bought me my first computer. Okay. And um, it was a Tandy 1000. I'll never forget it. And my best friend and I. So it's interesting that your, your father brought you into baseball and that was, yeah. your, that was your uh, supposed career path. There and you then go. Your mother there you go. brought you in the computer IT world. There you go. And, and then to be doubly blessed to go play a game which paid for my ability to get a degree in the technology that I had a passion for as well. So I'm doubly blessed. Well, if you've seen the, uh, the, the Netflix documentary about Quincy Jones, and he mm. talked about his uh, days when he was a child in Chicago growing up, and he wanted to be a gangster. Mm. Because, he said, you uh, want to be what you see. Yeah. And then his father moved them to Seattle. He and his mother uh, divorced. She had very difficult mental health issues. He moved to Seattle and was working two and three jobs. Mm. So what he saw then was... Uh, someone who would dedicate and work themselves to, to take care of his family. Mm. And that made a deep impression on him. Uh, but it's so interesting how we uh, become what we see. That's right. Uh, around us and how you did that with both parents in totally mm. different realms. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, what have they taught you about politics? Just, just that we're supposed to be civically engaged. Are they both? I'm sorry? Are they both civically engaged? Were they involved in politics? Did you see They the never ran for job? office or anything like that, but uh, in the household, we were taught the importance of voting, et cetera, okay. et cetera. I still... Were they politically active beyond that? Uh, um, I can say my mother was a delegate to the Democratic National Convention. That's a big yes. Yeah. The, <laughs> That's one a big year yes. when uh, Jesse Jackson was running for 88. president. 88. And he had come to Norfolk at the Norfolk Scope. I still can remember that. My mother and her sisters, my aunts and all, they were delegates and so forth. So. Yeah, he came, uh, he came to my college and uh, I was head of security for his visit. Mm. And uh, it was heady time. This is like 1987, I think mm. 87, spring yeah. 87, when they were yeah. getting ready to do the, yeah. the 88 tour. And I was struck by how well he could deliver a message and the cadence with which he spoke. Mm -hmm. And I was drawn into it. I, mean, I was like, this guy is really good. I don't believe a thing he says. Oh, man. But, but daggone, if he's not he saying deliver, it well. Right? He was, I was, I, we had a, a lunch with his, I think one of his sons and some other staff members there at the local restaurant. And I was just, I said, that guy's amazing. Yeah. He's yeah. really, I mean, I, I said, he made me believe things I don't agree with. Yeah. <laughs> but when you think about a life like that mm -hmm. during the time in mm -hmm. which as Absolutely. a student, um, some of the coordination, I mean, we kind of read history, right? And then it's like as though it happened like that mm -hmm. when truthfully uh, it was some courageous things going on with those gentlemen. Absolutely. And Absolutely. I, uh, what comes to mind for me is this picture standing on the balcony with Jesse Jackson, Ralph Abernathy. Well, on the yeah. day Martin Luther King was assassinated yeah. in 1968, April yeah. 4th. So they actually were with him yeah, well, yeah. on an ongoing basis. Oh, yeah. I mean, just all the time. Right. And so... Living in the moment of history. Yeah, and then, like I said, uh, today, right, it's hard to go most places of uh, importance or, um, say, an institution without... Uh, respect for Dr. King, and so in, even here in the Commonwealth, we have a holiday, right? Right. And often on the floor, I hear people pointing to excerpts about him mm -hmm. and talking about the dream, mm -hmm. right? But he was such an amazing uh, human, human being, and so much uh, what he was about was the humanity right. of folks. So, interestingly enough, uh, a lot of that change that has to take place uh, for us in the nation and in the Commonwealth, actually, happens um, in such ways that when you're in it, it's not always popular to root for humanity. It's not always popular. In fact, I think the numbers say that when Dr. King died, he had something like a 70% disapproval rating 
amongst Americans. And amongst the black community, it was like a 50% dis disapproval. Really? Yeah. And so... What was... That I've never heard, those, those numbers. Um, what was the pushback against King within the black community? What was what was the what it's, was, it's a what human could, thing. Yeah, to today? You know, we're, we're sixty years. Hence. Yeah, I'm not being critical of anybody. No, no, no. But I'm just I'm wondering, just like, saying, what would they have said that would have been the same thing? You're people, doing it wrong. I mean, the same the, thing people say today, right? Uh, whenever you push against the grain, the grain you're not. It, it, it's not. It's not ever going to be uh, uh, a popular thing. Right. I mean, my faith teaches me, as a Christian, that. Uh, there's a crowd, always, but the question is, do you have to necessarily follow the crowd? Because on Monday, there was a crowd that was, that was saying, Hosanna, Hosanna to the highest. Mm -hmm. But in the same week, it's crucified. by Friday, right. some of the same people were saying, crucify him. Cruc so my father and my mother have always taught me, don't follow the crowd. And when you see me here in the General Assembly, and I'm not in any way trying to pat myself on the back or anything no, like I'm that, you won't find me in following the crowd. Um, As a member of a political party, though, when votes come up and it's a caucus vote, uh, we all know that, that push and pull within the team because you're running for re-election assumed. Sure. Assuming you're running for re-election, you got to win the, the primary to get the nomination. Your district is a, is a safe Democratic district. It's easy, it's easier to go with the crowd hmm. than to pull back and go. No, I'm going to take this pitch. This, you know, I'm let this one go. It's not always going to be easy. No. Again, you can't follow the crowd. It's not always easy. Um, it never is. In fact. Um, to use that baseball analogy, there'll be some pitches that come on the outside of the plate. It's not your pitch. And if you try to pull it if you want to, uh, you're not going to be uh, successful. You yeah. need to sometimes keep your hands back, right? Push Throw them hands out Take and drive it back where it came from. That's right. What's, uh, what's your pitch in politics? What's, what, do you, what do you like to see? That what do you swing at? You said, this is my groove. You're an IT guy. You're an appropriations, an MBA. Uh, what, is, what is your bailiwick policy-wise? <laughs> I mean, I, I try not to hone into just one thing. I try, I'm, a, I'm a compilation of all of that that you just said. Okay. And so that's how I view the legislation that comes. It comes with... Um, understanding that we want to be successful in getting legislation done and so if you follow some of the things that I've championed or in some cases it may not even have been my own legislation right. but if um, at the core of who I am I understand that issue it may not always be an issue that is um, pushed from within my caucus sure. right um, but it's an important enough issue. Um, again, you're a business gentleman. This whole thing of productivity is really important, mm -hmm. right? But we overlay that with humanity as well. But technology is my passion. Okay. And technology is a tool for pr productivity, no matter what it is, uh, no matter what form of technology, it's a tool to get better productivity. Right. And so sometimes that doesn't always mesh with uh, people from a partisan perspective. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd rather thread the needle and get things done that are going to help uh, the Commonwealth. So if we're more productive and productivity is going up, that right. means the resources that we have are being used in a better way. If in, in, that, in that spirit... Um, are there issues or bills issues you can point to as, as being not in the crowd with your political party and going, you know, the Republicans got a point on this one? Because this is one of the questions I ask people on both sides of the aisle. Tell me something about the other party. You kind of go, Ugh, you know, that, that's a pretty good idea. It's not really partisan, but because it's theirs, I can't oppose it just because it's theirs. There's a lot of things that um, 
I don't know if I want to call it partisan, but they tend to have been um, controlled or shaped or given the impression <laughs> that it's a democratic issue. Right, right, right. Or it's a Republican issue. But the question is, uh, if it's good policy, that's where I'm, I'm coming from. And if you look into my background, you will see that I'm not just the politician, right? The elected side, right, right. trying to hurry up and get elected. But another hat is that I have been on the administrative house side of local and regional go and state government, mm -hmm. right? So on the administrative side, it's more of practicality. Okay. It's actually so you what- you see the whole game in front of you. Yeah. So I've worked for um, a commissioner of revenue, Ray Connor, who was a part of my first team. Okay. And was my first treasurer. Okay. Uh, on that same campaign that I had the mayor behind me. Um, I had a sheriff that I've worked for in John Newhart, who was the longest serving sheriff in the Commonwealth for mm -hmm. something 45 so you put years. A good, you put a good team on the field. Yeah, well, actually, that good team put me on the field. There you go. <laughs> nice turn of phrase there. Yeah. Good stuff. good stuff. And those were Democrats and Republicans that, okay. that, that, that centered around me and put me out there. And that's the lens of which I operate in practicality, uh, law enforcement, right? So in this space today, you hear, well, Republicans, you right, know, right, stand right. for Reports. law enforcement and blah, blah, blah. Well, I'm a strong Democrat, and I stand strong behind law enforcement. But on the flip side, I don't stand blindly. Well, it's because we're, we're, we're so, we're so, Polarized because everything has to be binary. Yeah. Like if you're for the police, you can't be for yeah. changing the police. Yeah. If you're for defunding the police, you can't be for funding something else. And yeah. If you're funding Medicaid, you can't fund education. And then it becomes this everything becomes us or them. Yeah. And after a while, you, you can't play that game. And the interesting thing is a, a, a term that you just uh, pointed out defund the police. So that's the political side of stuff. Right terms get thrown out and then all of a sudden, right, the crowd <laughs> starts coming either for or against, right? I mean, we're two years past it and then uh, and Biden but, uses it in his State of the Union the other night. Yeah. But, uh, here we go. So the thing is, um, working in law enforcement, right, with a technology overlay mm -hmm. in that space, um, I understand that there are um, some things that society, as society, we ask too much to go out of police officers <laughs> and out of sheriffs, right. deputies. Right. Um, when they're doing their job, we ask them to do quite a bit, right? Not we're we're asking things. them to listen to problems that people, and they haven't been formally trained to be a counselor and so forth and, and so we're on. We're thrusting a lot on our public We're service. throwing all of this on them sure. and expecting perfection. Right. out of them. Right. You can't make a mistake or we're going to come after you, right? And with not a lot of pay, let's be honest. Yeah, we don't, yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. Our expectations versus what we pay are not aligned. Not aligned. Not but, but I also am a product of playing that recreation baseball. This was long before sure. the stuff they have today with the clubs and club ball mm -hmm. and traveling the country, competing, oh, yeah. and you're like nine it's years old. It's nuts. it's nuts. I did it with my kids. It's nuts. <laughs> and my daughter, our youngest daughter, we've done it with her in track and the oldest in cheering. So oh, I yeah. know all about that stuff. Oh, travel teams. But, you know, in the community where I grew up, the police officers ran the league. Okay. Not, not, not. A pickup game. No, no, no. They were the, but they were the officers sure. yeah. for the South Norfolk Boys Baseball Association. They were the officers. The deputies were coaches. The firefighters were coaches. Um, so that really firefighters that really were police, bound the community together. Police officers. Yeah, and it's it's because uh, they lived in the neighborhoods too. Right? They lived in the neighborhoods. They were the coaches. You're talking about. Law enforcement. This is in, late 70s, early 80s? Yeah, 70s. Okay, 70s. You know, so what 
I mean, imagine the intelligence, right, that law enforcement can get by being involved in the community. Sure. So they're taking the kids back then. Sure, you know, sure. it was nothing for the coach to come through. With Are they doing that today? Pick up truck. Does that, that uh, construct still exist today? I just don't see that. Oh, that'd be a that'd be a revolution. If it it did. would be, and 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 not a you know three on three basketball tournament. No, no, no. And that's, that's a one time thing. And yeah, then yeah, no, gone. no. It's ephemeral. It's uh, and that's why I love baseball. And you can't make them do it. It has to be an ingrained kind of a thing. No, so in my community where I grew up in South North, it was ingrained that, and not just my coach, but with eight or nine teams in the league. Yeah, but I think that would be a, is that, it, I think that'd be a key element in today's uh, society is to have oh, yeah. those uh, public servant leaders, Oh yeah. part of that community development, not oh, just from the man. Intel side, yeah. of seeing what's going on, but you know, actually it would probably be good to have that too but just from a fabric of a community. Oh yeah, one of the greatest lessons I, I learned in playing the game um, uh, was from a firefighter. One of my coaches, uh, William Cartwright was his name, um, about hitting. One of the, the best lessons I learned was from him. He said, you just gotta smile at him. <laughs> I mean, it, who would have thought? How I throw at you. <laughs> who would have thought, right? Right. He said, comes at you, <laughs> you know, just smile at him. Oh, it's like in that movie. And um, step right back up uh, into Field the Field of quit. Dreams. Yeah. You remember Field of Dreams when he says, wink yeah. at him? Yeah. <laughs> Tell him you know what's coming. Yeah. <laughs> so, so he throws yeah. at him. He's like, what are you throwing at the kid for? He's like, yeah. he winked at me. Hey, kid, don't wink. <laughs> yeah. But then you just hit it. Right. 400 feet. There you go. Okay. He might have just okay. uh, hit me in the ribs. Are you involved in any baseball leagues? I know you got two well, actually, doing. that's how I got involved civically. Okay. Right? When I left Norfolk State, I decided to give back to the community and coach in the league that I grew up in uh, because I had learned so many fundamental sure, sure, things sure. that you I didn't back. learn and I wanted you to give back. back. And um, I was coaching. And Mayor Ward, former uh, African-American history professor for me at Norfolk State, uh, came out to throw out the first pitch. Mm -hmm. He threw out the first pitch that game. He said, what are you doing out here, man? I didn't know you were back over in here. I thought you had moved away or whatever. And right. You're here in the community. You need to come on out to an organization called Chesapeake Men for Progress and meet some folks. And um, they met every second Saturday. And I went over there with that group of giants of men in the city of Chesapeake. And um, they were councilmen, they were mm -hmm. city manager, they were members of the school board, they were members, they were administrators, right. assistant superintendents, they were business owners, they were involved in the community and so forth. And I went in there, you know, with a laptop back then and they just thought that I was some kind of genius. <laughs> Who's the kid? Yeah, yeah. So I just listened to them all and uh, just humble, okay. sitting at their feet. and. That was the beginning of me getting involved civically. Now, what became the impetus for me running was, um, I, th I think I mentioned to you how I had worked on the inside of local government mm -hmm. in the city. And I had worked with uh, some firefighters on some things uh, at the fire department because I was a, um, a programmer at the Department of uh, Information Technology. And the public safety arena was an assignment that I had. Okay. So um, I started playing adult softball with the firefighters. They had a, a team in a league, and we started playing together. And two of my friends um, I became very close to, one of which, uh, Johnny Hudgens was his name, um, they had kind of worn me out about and everybody about the raw equipment that they had and how they needed upgraded equipment and so forth. And they were complaining about the communications system that they had to talk <clears throat> to one another. Okay. And um, the city wouldn't, uh, in the budget, approve for an upgrade because it sounded pretty expensive. Oh well, yeah. And at but that that's time- what, That's what they need. Yeah. And, but they kept asking for it year after year and they weren't getting it. And Johnny was dispatched, uh, his unit, his company, to a building. It was an older building. It was an auto parts store uh, that had caught on fire. 
and they went in to fight the fire in this old building. And he went in and lost communication with the folks on the outside. In the middle of the fire, the roof collapsed. And he was in there, and they couldn't communicate with him and to find him where he was. And he ultimately perished in oh, that no. fire. Yeah. And so to me, it made me a little angry inside that we have the resources. And that was your impetus for running? That was, I think, ultimately. That, that was the, the, that's the first what, seed of like, what's, that, I, something got to change. You know, you know, this isn't right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. I know we have the money, but um, folks just didn't want to step out there and do what needed to be done right. to pay for that upgrade in their equipment. And lo and behold, what really tipped me over to run was after he died, the next cycle, they paid for it. Isn't that frustrating as all get out? Cliff, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Let's chop it up a little bit more and get a little different sure, personal so people sure, can get sure. to know you, aside from baseball and all the metaphors that we've, that we've done here. Uh, favorite baseball team? Atlanta Braves. Oh, that's so sad. Grew up Skip loving it, loving Skip it you know. Um, <laughs> Hank Aaron was the coach. Okay. Okay. Um, what's my man? Um, David Justice. Sure. Chipper Jones. Okay. That whole crew back then, that was, man. That was a. Those were some teams. As a Pirates fan, it's it's not. Well, it's, it's, my father was a Pirates fan. Really. And so we grew up loving the Pirates as well. The. Seventy is my hero. Seventy nine. Oh yeah, we are Dave family. Dave Parker, absolutely. Willie Stargell. Pops. We are family. Oh, that's, that's <laughs> in fact, well, one of my roommates in college. Pop Stargell was his um, um, godfather. Really? Yeah. Don he, Sutton, Hall of Fame pitcher for the Dodgers, said, Stargell didn't hit you hard. He took away your dignity. <laughs> 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 Favorite football team? Uh, the Raiders. Okay. Wow. That's yeah, because that, all of that's in the time frame in which I sure, grew sure. up. Sure, sure. 70s. A, yeah. a Steelers fan now, so we're not, we really should not talk about that. Right. Um, let's talk about favorite movies. What are your top three favorite movies? If you had to watch one tonight, what would it be? Uh, what's that movie, um, man? Uh, Denzel Washington. I'm He's a fantastic. fan. I'm a fan. Um, Is he a police Richard? officer? I can't think of the name of it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can't remember it either. Uh, favorite TV shows? Favorite TV shows? I like to rewind to things that just make you laugh, right? Okay. So I think about things like. Um, Sanford and Son. Okay. <laughs> we're just so the, I can we're laugh. Kids right? I get it. Just so I can laugh. And then something like Good Times. Okay. Was a show that was okay. a favorite. We, as we, well. we all fell in love with Janet Jackson. Yeah, and yeah, <laughs> yeah. JJ and Thelma and okay. the hardworking dad, James, yeah, James, James and John wife. Amos. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Florida, Florida. Yeah, just yeah. a hard-working okay. family. You connected with both of those. Oh okay. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, favorite books. Um. Probably my my favorite, the favorite book probably would be uh, The Substance of Things Hoped For by Dr. Proctor. Okay. Hope comes back. Yeah. Yeah. And Cornell West has a book out now that I've kind of been following, Dr. Cornell West. Um, um, Prophetic Fire. Okay, prophetic of fire. One of, one of the things I love about Cornell West is his relationship with Robbie George, no. and they're and when they have oh yeah yeah yeah, debates. man, that is that some, is what I think is the essence of higher education. Of how people can come together exactly philosophically, a little bit different, but at the core, talking about humanity. I, that I that word was on the tip of my tongue before you said it, and I love that you said it. Thank you. Absolutely. Because that's what it's all about in the end, isn't it? In the end. That's what it's all about. Uh, from womb to tomb. <laughs> we're right here. No one, none of us are better than anybody else. I don't look at myself as being better than anybody else because I, I may have figured some. Right. And I don't think anybody is any better than me, right? And then that Dr. West would tell you yeah. that um, we're all coming from the same place. Exactly. What, uh, I, I sense you're, you're a strong faith. Do you have a, a specific passage in the Bible that you, that you fall back to or like to have ready? Probably. Uh, my mother would constantly tell us growing up that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And we're going to leave it right there.
Yeah. Cliff Hayes, this has been an enjoyable conversation. I Likewise. wish you the very best today on the VIP podcast brought to you by VCT, the Broadband Association of Virginia and Virginia Free. Please subscribe, like, and share on Spotify, Apple, and YouTube. Have a great day. You get that budget passed, would you? There you go. There you go. <laughs> by the end of the day, Cliff Hayes is going to get it done. Thank you for joining us.